and then you get you know folks in law enforcement who are upset you know oh well that's that's anti-police no it's not it's 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 as a whole it's not you well i'm one of the good ones yeah oh, i'm sure you are but it's not about you it's about this system that's happening it's about these outcomes that we have and what are we going to do about it you know i used to say that uh our system is broken but it's it's not broken it is so robust it's working exactly the way it was designed to work jeff welcome to the show you are a portland-based Japanese American racial equity activist and educator. For years, you worked in guest service management at the Walt Disney Company. You've been the featured speaker at Portland Design Week and multiple creative and marketing conferences and events. And you also host corporate workshops on systemic racism and implicit bias. And today, we're talking about racial equity at work in different industries and even in our government. Uh, but before we jump into these discussions, I'd love to know from one Asian American marketing professional to another. Um, what's your journey been like um, as a creative person of color? And what's been the driving force that keeps you going? You know, it's, uh, it's interesting growing up uh, as uh, one of the very few um, Asian kids, if not the only Asian kid uh, in school in Indianapolis, Indiana in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was, uh, you know, experienced a lot of uh, discrimination and racism, not just from uh, bullying and, you know, uh, fellow students, but also uh, even experiencing it from um, teachers, administrators. Um, not uh, not a lot of it, but enough to make me realize that I was uh, something different than a lot of other kids in school. Um, that always stayed with me. Uh, my parents actually ended up uh, starting the... Um, Hoosier chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League uh, with a lot of other amazing folks uh, back in the 70s, starting that chapter in Indiana, where the Japanese American Citizens League nationally, I think, started in 1929. Uh, so we get to the 70s, and now we have this chapter in Indiana, and uh, started hearing more conversations about uh, racism, race, and it really, uh, it really had an effect on seven-year-old me. And uh, I carried that with me uh, through my uh, through my life until now. It was always something that I did on my own. It was uh, just community work, um, community activism, being involved in uh, a lot of racial justice uh, movements. And um, when, I mean, I think a lot of us don't realize, um, you know, maybe years ago that this could be something that we could do professionally. I always had my communications career that was separate. <laughs> my PR stuff, my marketing stuff and all that. Um, and then the the racial justice stuff was always on my own. And so to have an opportunity to um, to make that my career was really amazing and quite a privilege. There's so many people doing this work, as you know, that don't get paid for it. And um, yeah, so it's an amazing privilege. It's something that um, my um, life experiences have really kind of led me to this to this work. And um it's it's a real privilege to do it. Yeah, it's um, I, I totally resonate with that process mm -hmm. of, you know, having the separation between, you know, I I am a you know studied communications and and I'm in marketing as well, and so I always had this idea of like, well, the activism stuff that's just me, that's like separate. I shouldn't bleed that into uh, my professional work because there is you know, a disconnect between the two. Cause I felt like I mm -hmm. couldn't talk about race. I couldn't talk about these social issues, especially when it comes to marketing and advertising, where you're trying to be so user friendly, so non-confrontational that like having the opportunity to just bridge these things is such an amazing opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. And when it comes to diversity, equity, inclusion, um, you know, there are a ton of different ways that a company can diversify its team. They can you know, diversity can technically include diversity of ideas, diversity of languages, uh, uh, skills, gender, age. Uh, and sometimes companies say that they are diverse, but in reality, they might have age and skill diversity, but they have absolutely no gender or racial diversity. Uh, so my question mm -hmm. to you is, how do you educate people on the importance of racial equity specifically when they work in an office that has adopted a, you know, we don't see color or we're colorblind type of mentality. 
Yeah, it, I, you hear that a lot. You know, we have a very diverse workforce, and <laughs> and like, well, okay, how racially diverse? And for me, it's all about race. It is. Uh, you, uh, you can't uh, have an effective inclusion uh, program or or equity program without leading with race. And the problem with that is for a lot of folks, um, you know, in the in dominant culture. Uh, or dominating culture, which uh, Leah Deshay said uh, on your program, and mm -hmm. I think that's an amazing thing. I'm going to adopt that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, folks in in uh, dominating culture um, seem to either intentionally or unintentionally avoid race mm -hmm. it, because it's uncomfortable. Or and you know, it's interesting. A lot of the the biggest barriers we have in this work is white progressives. Yeah, uh, you know, and it's uh, oh, and, and 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 they'll talk about anything but race. So when you're, uh, so I'm jumping around a little bit here, but I think for me, it's it's all about uh, educating folks about how important it is to lead with race, and uh, then people, oh, so other identities don't matter. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, what uh, what about um, you know centering on gender equity or? LGBTQ uh, IA equity or disability equity. And I said, you know, my response is always, so all those identities uh, you see is white. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that's the thing. Um, if, when we picture uh, veterans, when we picture seniors, when we picture these folks, uh, you and I might picture them differently than, uh, than other folks. Uh, and I think that's the real problem that people don't understand that the intersectionality of race, anytime you add race to the equation, it always uh, adds, you know, the, the deepest uh, disparities. We see the most oppression there. So where if you have, you know, uh, a white person who uses a wheelchair, um, the experience uh, for them would be a lot different than, uh, you know, a black trans woman uh, who uses a wheelchair. And so it becomes this competition and it's really unfortunate because you can see the data. This work has to be data driven. You look at the data, you understand that race will always show us the deepest disparities. And so when we uh, remove disparities for folks of color, we're removing you know, barriers for everybody, creating a system that works the best for everyone. And the system wasn't created to work for everyone. You know, I used to say that uh, our system is broken, but it's it's not broken. It is so robust. It's working exactly the way it was designed to work. And systems are built to perpetuate themselves. So that's the hard work of racial equity. And so um, really, and how do we do that? How do we convince folks that that we need to lead with race? We start with looking at the history of race. You know, here in Oregon, uh, I think a lot of people look at um, this region, the Pacific Northwest, as kind of this progressive utopia. In a lot of ways it is, but not when it comes to race. And Oregon has a very specific, um, uh, really tough history around race. Uh, you couldn't live, if you were black, you couldn't live in Oregon until 1926 legally. And if you did happen to live here before then and you were black, you were threatened with uh, 39 lashes, uh, the lash law that we had in Oregon. And so um, all the, you know, the ghosts of all that history live on to today. So when you look at the history and you understand um, the laws and policies that have been put in place uh, to keep power for the dominating culture um, and to exclude all others, that's, that's a tough, that's a tough hill to climb, you know, to get out of all that. And it shows people that you, you know, that not everybody gets to start from the same starting point. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear all the time, well, why don't you pull yourself up by your bootstraps and work hard like I did? Well, maybe you don't have those bootstraps. And so the history, I think, is really key on showing folks. I mean, it's, it's a real eye opener. Uh, like I said, especially in Oregon, there's some things here that, you know, uh, and, and people don't understand. Uh, maybe I, I don't know how it's possible that people don't know about the incarceration of Japanese Americans. One hundred and twenty thousand Japanese Americans incarcerated, a lot of them uh, American citizens, forcibly removed from their homes, put in, uh, you know, behind barbed wire in American concentration camps. It's a part of history that you don't really hear about. I brought it up when I was a kid in school in Indiana. 
And the teacher said, Jeff, I'm sure that that didn't happen. I'm sure that we would, oh. as the, I'm sure as Americans, we would never do that to ourselves. I'm like, well, wow. Okay. Well, let me bring someone in from show and tell and, and, and he'll talk to you uh, for, about his experience uh, in the camps. But there's so much about our history that people don't know. Chinese exclusion laws, mm-hmm. uh, you know, all this stuff, right? And um, the enslavement of black people, obviously, you know. Uh, so with a, a better understanding of that history and understanding that uh, the, the ghosts of that history still live on today, um, I think people have a better understanding of how, of why race uh, is, is what we should be leading with. We try to avoid saying focus on race because focus just that's the one thing and and nothing else but Mm. when you lead with it and then understand the intersectionality and understand how the different layers of oppression uh you know kimberly crenshaw leads this work in intersectionality i think kind of co-invented the term right Mm -hmm. so um so that's that's one of the challenges Uh, so we start with history uh, we start with common language, making sure people understand that equity is not just another buzzword. It is a separate term from inclusion. It's a separate term from uh, from diversity. You know, people are like, hey, I'm going to your diversity training. I'm like, no, it's not diversity <laughs> training. Uh, oh, my gosh. If you're just doing diversity work, man, I hope you're doing more than that. Uh, I always kind of cringe when I when people are like, I'm the uh, diversity officer or I'm the <laughs> I'm the diversity manager. I work in the diversity office. I'm like, wow, okay, so you're in charge of getting a, a variety of people together. <laughs> and that's it. Wow. Uh, so variety is important, obviously. Diversity is important, but uh, you, you've got to go, you know, definitely beyond that. So uh, I'm, uh, I think I'm uh, maybe rambling a little bit, but uh, so we start with history uh, and we start uh, talk, really having those conversations about um, – were you aware of this history? What was surprising or impactful for you about this history? Uh, and it's amazing how many people don't know. Uh, folks of color, you know, we know our history. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes it's shocking that others don't, right? Yeah. And, I mean, you're absolutely right about the, um, the way that that legacy of history um, bleeds into so many of the implicit biases and just the values that people have everything from what people think you know um the the standard leader looks like or um you know what a um a a a, an all-star executive team is supposed to look like and so there's all these different um layers that are included in this discussion and on that subject of inclusion um, I wanted to bring up the issue of workplace harassment Um, as some of the nerdy folks on the live community know uh, the video game company Activision Blizzard the ones who made Call of Duty Warcraft Overwatch um, they were sued over rampant sexual harassment and employee discrimination Uh, and the allegations in the lawsuit talk about the way that Activision Blizzard created a frat boy culture even though I haven't worked for Activision Blizzard myself, I have worked for a big tech company with a very similar frat boy culture. Um, so when you see companies with these types of cultural problems, um, how, the, how, how do you sort of identify the source of this problem? And how do you even begin to solve these toxic behaviors within the work culture? Like, do you just go in and fire the the problematic employees do we reform and coach toxic managers like what do we do well i think focusing on individuals is not the way to go uh for your first step it's to look at the system Mm. i think that's you know when you're doing this work it's it's always you know the question you ask is what is the what is the culture of this business or this organization uh and a lot of times I'll define culture is what's happening when the boss is not around. Ah, right. Like so, you know, you have to see what, what policies are in place. What is it, uh, you know, what are the, the company values? Are they just put out there for, you know, performative, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, approaches or is it something that's genuine? And, and what are those policies that are in place to deal with this? What is it? It starts with hiring. Well, it starts with, um, you know, recruitment. What is the recruitment process? What are you looking for? Are mm-hmm. these based on uh, dominating culture, 
uh, definitions of what an effective leader are, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, that, you know, we need someone who's, uh, you know, take charge kind of person, you know, someone who's uh, bold, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and you're like, well, uh, okay. So if uh, if you look at a, a, a situation where you're in a, a conference room in a meeting and we can pretend there's no plague going on and we're all, you know, <laughs> sitting around this uh, conference room table, and uh, there is a white man in the meeting who's bold and has this, you know, take charge attitude. Mm-hmm. Uh, he might be described one way. If you have a woman uh, who, uh, you know, exhibits those same uh, behaviors, she might be described another way. Mm-hmm. If a black man uh, exhibits those same behaviors in the in the meeting, he'll be described a different way. Mm-hmm. So, are you are you really you know, approaching your, uh, your policies in your company with, uh, a cultural consciousness. You know, we hear the term a lot, cultural competency. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know if that's possible. That's, that's kind of a tough charge, you know, to be culturally competent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not competent in my own cultures, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, a half Japanese guy who grew up in Indiana. And so in Indiana, I was really Japanese, you know, my school lunches scared the other kids and all that. Uh, but when I went to Japan, man, I was really Indiana, right? <laughs> so it, it just, uh, so competency, I don't know, but consciousness, always asking the questions, uh, to yourself, not putting the burden on other people to explain it for you, but doing your homework, asking those questions, being aware that not everybody gets to navigate this world in the same way. So going back to the policies, what are the policies in place? I think that's the key. Uh, if you're hiring, uh, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, basing your criteria on hiring people on a bro culture, if you are fostering that bro culture, you're going to, you're going to get more bros again, systems, they perpetuate themselves. So, um, you know, a lot of times companies will say, Hey, you know, we want to bring you in to do a training. And I said, okay, well, before we do the training, let's talk about what outcomes you're looking for here. Mm -hmm. Equity is all about outcomes. Equity doesn't care about your intent. I think that's another tough thing that people are, are grapple with. It doesn't seem fair, right? Well, I didn't mean to shoot you in the face. Well, <laughs> you did. And so the outcome is I got to go to the hospital. I don't know why I'm using Dick Cheney references now. <laughs> they're, they're pretty dated. Uh, but I, I think that, so they forget that it's it's about the outcomes. And so if we are... Um, really trying to change the culture. Um, whether it's a genuine thing or, you know, there's also the, the pragmatic thing of, of keeping yourself out of legal trouble as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, that certainly is a, a motivator for a lot of companies and you can, but doing it for the, the right reasons, um, you know, it's gotta be a part of it too, because it, you have to respect people. People see right through this stuff. Mm-hmm. And when you get these mission and vision statements that are just all these platitudes that just, oh, whatever, <laughs> you know. If you're going to put those out there, how are you practicing those? Can people in your company recite them? Do they know them? And not, not necessarily word for word, but do they know what the true meaning of these, these uh, you know, values are for your company? So, again, I really think it goes back to the system. What, what do you have in place? Um for recruitment, for uh, training, for uh, retention. What are you doing to make sure that you don't have this culture? Um, and it's it's a tough charge. And if you're lazy about it, you're not going to get great results. Mm-hmm. Time and time again, we see companies, well, all our engineering staff is white and they're male because... Um, you know, folks of color aren't interested in doing this kind of work. Now, it's hard to hear that. There's a little sliver of truth to that because a lot of folks tend to, um, you know, with with all the stuff that we're inundated with in media and family and school and church and all this that maybe tells us that we're not, um, that those jobs aren't for us. Mm-hmm. Or maybe we don't even know those jobs exist, mm-hmm. you know? How many young, uh, you know, kids of color uh, realize that you can have an amazing career designing athletic footwear? 
you may not like you, know, you may not even think about things because you think about um the the jobs and the the type of stuff that your you know family members or people close to you you know what they did mm-hmm. right i come from an army family i'm an army brat so what did i do i joined the army um because that's what i knew and i was i knew that i could get money for college if i did that so um yeah so again it goes back to a systemic problem that we have uh in our culture in our country um if we're going to try to recruit people well it has to start with are you working with youth uh to get them uh interested in what you're doing are you really doing some genuine outreach um and involvement with community are you seeking out uh, cultural and community groups to see, uh, you know, maybe having a job fair or something like that to to really, you know, find those people. Because there are a lot of folks of color, obviously, that can do these jobs. Uh, but if they don't know about them, if you're just telling your professional networks to spread the word, it may not get to uh, a lot of us. So there's uh, laziness is not going to get you some great results in that uh, in that respect. Yeah, and I, I I'm I really appreciate that you sort of talk about that way that you know it's work you know you you can't go into this thinking that ah, i'm gonna hire, hire an asian dude and he's gonna like magically <laughs> spice things up and, and make everyone woke through i don't know cultural osmosis or some shit um but sort of going back on the first question um mm-hmm. and tying back what we were recently just talking about um i want to talk more about small business owners because as you know you know the pandemic inspired a lot of people to pursue that small business idea that they had, you know, stashed in the back pocket for 10 years. And now we're seeing all types of companies and brands offering their services. As somebody who helps well-established companies understand and solve their problems with, um, you know, equity, what advice do you have for solo entrepreneurs who want to infuse those values early on when it comes to equity inclusion? Um, and how do they go about including that into their brand or the customer relations? Uh, yeah, how do they do that? I think it's all about outcomes again. Uh, where do you want to be? You figure out where you want to be, and then you work backwards from there to get there. Hmm. So you define very clear outcomes. The thing about being a small business owner, it's you know when you when you have these outcomes, um, these desired outcomes, these goals, um, if you I think a lot of small business owners think that they're locked into those, but they can change. You know, my business plan uh, and business approach from 2005 till now, it's completely different, completely different. (laughs) So I think it's, it's important for small business owners to understand that, that you can change these things, but when you have them down and those, that's what you've agreed uh, to yourself that this is, these are the outcomes you want to achieve. um, Then you've got to go all in with intentionality, with, uh, you know, uh, and, and so if one of your outcomes is to be, um, culturally conscious and socially just then, okay. So you, now you know where you're going to be, how are you going to get there? And, you know, there's so much out there. There's so much information out there. Um, you know, uh, the, the people that you're interviewing, um, you know, on your, on your channel, there's so much that, that, that people can learn just from doing that. You know, mm-hmm. YouTube university is, is pretty amazing. Oh yeah. Uh, you, you know, you have to be, you have to be careful of course, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. And so, um, again, I, I think you really have to start with those outcomes again, if that's what equity is all about, then let's define it and then figure out the roadmap, how to get there. I like that. I, I like that idea of, um, you know, reverse engineering the process and starting with those outcomes. Uh, and another topic that you cover during your workshops is this idea of an equity lens. Um, what exactly is an equity lens? Um, how do I make one and what's, what becomes possible when you have one? Well, an equity lens is basically questions. Hmm. Your uh, organization will move in the direction of the questions you ask. So the questions, uh, you know, an equity lens can be a very simple thing. It can be, uh, you know, uh, spreadsheets of questions and all this uh, data, whatever, but it could be just very simple. Uh, how will, uh, this policy or, uh, procedure affect people of color? 
how will the how will this decision um you know are there any barriers that this decision will put up for for folks of color and uh -huh. insert whatever identity you want mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh will this decision uh create barriers for folks with disabilities you know that kind of thing and it's just those questions that you just everything you consider you just stop and run it through those questions and those questions, of course, are based on the outcomes that you want. Mm. That's all an equity lens is. It's a list of questions you ask yourself when you're when you're taking on any decision. Okay, so I've created this um, uh, this job announcement mm -hmm. uh, for recruitment. Now I'm going to analyze it by asking these questions. Um, okay. Right. So um, if a job requirement is uh, that you have to have uh, a cover letter. Well, what are the, how could that present a barrier to somebody? So if the job is you need a truck driver and they have to have a cover letter, why? You don't need to be a, an eloquent writer to be a truck driver. You have to be a professional and you have to know a lot of stuff mm -hmm. to be able to do that job. But cover letter writing isn't necessarily something that you need to have, you know. So, you know, I've seen job descriptions where, oh, you, you have to be able to live 50 pounds. Yeah. Why? There's no, there's no reason why you'd need to lift, lift 50 pounds. So that, that excludes uh, a lot of folks with disabilities. So uh, the, it, we tend not to think about things that don't affect us. And so that's why you always have to ask those questions. It's really kind of that checklist. Am I doing what I said I was going to do in those outcomes? Uh, and really, uh, and then checking your implicit bias as well. You know, that's a, those equity lens questions help you uh, with those knee jerk assumptions you make because of your implicit bias. So it really is uh, it's it's a good tool and it can be something as detailed as, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sort of equity plan mm -hmm. for your, uh, you know, that are asking very, very specific questions about things. Or it could just be that general. How is this going to impact? folks of color oh okay well, i like that because mm -hmm. you know it it does like you said in terms of intentionality it really does force you to be intentional about everything like you know, how is my you know interactions with my customers how is the company culture with uh, you know among employees um mm -hmm. now going more on these uh you know companies that need a lot more work to be done um i don't know about you i am a huge uh fan of documentaries and i especially love documentaries about like horrible companies and you know the, the rise and fall due to toxicity and greed like that is just my shit um specifically uh, i'm thinking of the we work documentary and the lula road documentaries uh, which both feature companies that used inclusive language to hide their corruption uh, so they had you know diverse marketing they sold themselves as progressives and feminists uh, but of course it was all smoke and mirrors to hide from the rampant exploitation, the harassment, um, and the fact that they were still predominantly very white. Um, mm -hmm. As somebody who lives and works in Portland, um, I'm sure you've come across companies and business owners who, you know, they truly believe that they're doing good. They, you know, uh, they don't think that they have any problems with their culture and that they're super woke and they're equitable and, you know, they don't really need your help. Um, in your experience, what does fake and shallow and ineffective equity and inclusion look like? Well, I, I think there's, so we're talking, uh, if we're talking about outcomes, uh, we'll see that uh, there may be companies with very inclusive language and, and uh, you know, uh, folks that are trying to genuinely create a culture of equity mm -hmm. and inclusion, but they're not getting it done for, for whatever reason. So you have that, and then you have companies that may be doing it intentionally. I try to think the best of people. Hopefully, I know I, I, I try not to be too cynical, although it's really hard in this work, of course, <laughs> especially when you see those documentaries. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, on on both of those, I mean, there's not much. If someone doesn't want to change, there's not much you can do. I've had it turn down work before because, you know, again, if someone's asking for a workshop, well, what else are you going to do? I don't want to just come in and do a, a workshop and, okay, that's it. We checked the box. We did that training. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't spend a lot of time in companies that don't want to change. Hmm. 
It's not my circus. So I, um, but the companies that are having those really unfortunate outcomes who genuinely want to do it, maybe they just don't know how. Does that make sense? So they have all this inclusive language and all that, but their yeah, it's, like it's, don't... it's it's more about like them not going through the extra steps of like, okay, I I put the the inclusive color and wrapping paper over it, but I didn't like worry about the contents inside of it. Right. Or it's you know what? I'm good. I'm a I'm a progressive. Oh. You know, I I I know my intent, mm-hmm. and my intent is to be. Uh, inclusive and you know have an equitable equitable workplace but maybe they don't know what that is maybe they don't understand their own implicit bias that they're making assumptions about uh you know certain things but but that goes back to the intent versus outcome uh you know discussion where i don't have anything to worry about i'm not racist yeah yeah you can <laughs> still you can still participate in in activities that have racist outcomes or policies that have racist outcomes if you if you're not intentionally racist Mm -hmm. and so i think i think everyone needs to step back and say this is not about you being a racist um it's it's about what the outcomes are you know it happens all the time it happens to me all the time I, i live and breathe this work but i catch myself all the time of of uh, doing something that uh oh that i'm just so ashamed about right i can't believe i thought that you know that knee-jerk reaction uh, my implicit bias was was there that i made an assumption about somebody or whatever and so if you're not checking that you can uh have the best intent in the world but your if your outcomes aren't there um then you've got to check yourself that's where the equity lens and all that comes in mm. and that and that that education but you have to be willing to be uh you have to be willing to understand that just because you're not racist that doesn't mean you're you're good. That doesn't mean it covers everything. You really have to put the work in, yeah, uh, to make sure you get those outcomes. So I don't know. I mean, I I have the luxury of not uh, of being able to choose not to work with organizations that don't want to change. Mm-hmm. The ones that really want to, uh, that's where that's where I find uh, that's where I find joy. Hmm. And when you see those light bulbs go off, when you see the oh. Okay. You know, when the intent is there and it's strong and, and genuine mm-hmm. and they're frustrated because they're not seeing the outcomes that they that they want or they're being accused of running a, a, a racially insensitive or non-inclusive workspace, you know, their feelings are hurt. Well, you got to get past that. It's not about you. It's about the system that we have here. It's about the system that's been created. It's about what, you know, the policies and procedures that are in place in your company that create those outcomes. So what can we do to change that? Wow. And so for my um, my last question, because I, you know, we're talking about the fact that this is about focusing on outcomes. Um, I'd love to focus and talk specifically about equity um, in the workplace and sort of extend that to other areas like in politics or in government. Um, And say, for example, you know, you got a call from Joe Biden. Uh, and they're like, hey, Jeff, uh, we love, you know, the work that you've been doing, uh, addressing implicit bias and, and systemic racism. Um, now we need to sort of think about how we can do that, but within policing or politics or school. Um, so if that was the case, like, how would you go about that? Like, would the same methods that work in these companies also apply on a national level, on a government level? Oh, absolutely. Again, it's looking at, at what outcomes you want. Um, you, you know, it, you, you can tell this is where I go to all the time. It's all about the outcomes and let's look at those. What are those outcomes? Uh, what the outcomes we have right now are, uh, we obviously have a disproportionate number of, um, young black men and boys being killed by police. That's the outcome. Mm-hmm. Does that mean all cops are racist? No, of course not. But there's something happening in the system. There's something happening there that is creating these outcomes. And there's so much to it. So, you know, and, and uh, you know, I don't want to oversimplify it by saying, oh, you know, it's just about outcomes. But the hard work comes into that culture change. What is it about law enforcement? Now, I, I'm, I'm not saying that it's all about implicit bias and all this stuff. 
there's something about law enforcement. There's something about the military that can attract white nationalists. What is it about that culture that attracts those folks? What is it about, you know? So the, the whole idea of, of this work is, you know, what's possible? Mm. What can it be? Just because police have always been the ones that, that uh, for the most part, show up after something has happened, uh, you know, after an emergency or after, a, you know, a, a, a alleged crime has, has happened. Uh, what about if they were more of a preventative uh, force? More, uh, well, not force, but a preventative, uh, you know, uh, type of uh, group, you know, where it was all about, you know, looking at the root causes. Mm -hmm. right because that's the other big part about equity okay we we see the outcomes now what caused those outcomes so really digging deep into into finding out what those root causes are and so maybe uh you know kind of flipping the the uh, the narrative narrative a little bit or not the narrative but the script on on what what can police what what can that look like mm -hmm. police being in community really doing community policing really being public safety uh you know folks um whatever we're doing right now is not working mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. And then you get, you know, folks in law enforcement who are upset, you know, Oh, well that's, that's anti-police. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's as a whole, it's not you. Well, I'm one of the good ones. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure you are, but it's not about you. It's about this system that's happening. It's about these outcomes that we have and what are we going to do about it? You can say it's not me all day long, but you still see these outcomes. Do you care about these outcomes? Right. So it's, it's tough. It's really tough. People get their feelings hurt a lot. Um, but I'd rather focus on folks who are, you know, who are dying. Yeah. You know, you can have your feelings hurt all day. What are we going to do about it so people stop dying? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that comes up a lot in, in this work. It's white comfort versus death and oppression of people of color. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a privilege of being uncomfortable, but these people are dying. So let's roll our sleeves up and figure out what's possible. What could what could we do? Do police police don't necessarily have to be what what we have always thought they are, right? So what can we do to uh, to create better outcomes? Because what we have right now it's broken. It's not working. So you know it's it's tough. Uh, going back to the systems are built to perpetuate themselves. You see this, uh, the most in government, you know, these institutions that have so much impact on communities mm -hmm. and the decisions that are being made on a daily basis. If they're not being done with an equity lens, if they're not being done with a genuine, uh, equitable approach, looking at those, those outcomes, um, then you're going to keep having the same things over and over again. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Equity is really a critical thinking exercise. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, you, you bringing up the whole, a lot, oftentimes the, the, the battle is centered around white comfort, you know, and, and it becomes a matter of, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to feel bad about this business that I've run, but it's, you know, you're already making these impacts. You're already hurting people. You're already, you know, uh, leaving out so many different uh, folks uh, from the workforce uh, with the types of job uh, listings that you're having, with the type of culture that you have, and that so many people would rather just not change and not feel bad that they made a bad decision as opposed to realizing and, and thinking, like you said, you know, what is possible? Um, you know, what, how, how can we sort of reimagine the police? How can we reimagine systems so, the, uh, so that they are more equitable as opposed to just looking at it from this perspective of, oh, well, you know, they're going to, uh, you know, they're going to come for me. They're going to cancel me. Um, it's more about, like, you know, there are, there are better options that are better ideas out there. Um, yeah. Jeff, it's yeah. been uh, great having you on the show, and I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, before we say goodbye to our audience, uh, what are you working on these days, and where can the Lack community find and support you? 
Well, I am excited because lately I've been working a lot with folks in the service industry, um, at, you know, restaurants and bars, uh, to see this the type of uh, this type of interest in getting this work done in that industry is pretty amazing, hmm. uh, and uh, it's really um, it's heartwarming, really, uh, to know that there are, uh, you know, the service industry industry has not always been interested in this kind of uh, this kind of work and these these types of outcomes. It's been a, a pretty rough industry. Uh, when it comes to uh, racism and sexism. And, and so now we're starting to see a shift, uh, certainly here in Portland. So um, I'm, I'm working with a, a few different clients uh, in the service industry. And it's like I said, it's bringing me a lot of joy when you have uh, when you see folks of color uh, say, I can't believe, you know, I've been I've been a bartender you know, my whole adult life and I can't believe we're in this room having this conversation. So thank you. And they're not thinking me, they're thinking their owners, right? The, the owners of the business. So it is, um, that's, that's really heartwarming. And that's something I'm really excited about right now. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, where can uh, our community uh, locate you and get in contact with you? At restaurants and bars. <laughs> no, uh, you, they can <laughs> uh, they can get uh, a hold of me at aiwcreative.com uh, slash equity. And um, yeah, it would be great to have a conversation about that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Jeff, for coming on to Lag Radio. Uh, we'll definitely have you back on. All right. Bye, everybody. 